Hello, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Derek Kane. Today I'm going to give an introduction to support vector machines. This presentation is just one topic in a series of topics that we've been going over in data science, machine learning, and predictive analytics. If this topic or other topics interest you, feel free to check out my other videos or subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much, and let's go ahead and begin. An overview of topics that we're going to get into today are going to be, well, what is a support vector machine? In the data science community, the algorithms can be very complex to understand, even for the practitioners of it. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to simplify what a support vector machine is in the, in the easiest way that I can so that we can fortify this concept in practice. We want to talk about support vector machine applications, how we can utilize them. Then we'll get into the topic of linear classifier separators. And then as an extension, we'll talk about the classification margin, what a, a maximum margin and support vectors are, and the soft margin approach. And finally, we'll talk about nonlinear support vector machines. We'll get into some feature space, holographic projection, the kernels and kernel tracking classification. And this is as far as our machine learning algorithms concerned, this is some of the higher level concepts that are really kind of tricky to understand, but are very cool when we're talking about higher dimensional spaces. So this is, this is definitely a more interesting example. And then we're going to dive into a practical application example where we're going to classify breast cancer. So we're going to have some data, and we're going to utilize a support vector machine to aid in this classification. Well, what is a support vector machine? Support vector machines were originally proposed by Bozer, Guyon, and Vatnik in 1992, and they've been gaining increasingly in popularity in the late 1990s. Support vector machines are currently among the best performers for a number of classification tests, ranging from text to genomic data. Okay. Support vector machines are incredibly powerful tools, and I can't stress that enough. Okay. But it is a black box technology. Okay. And support vector machines are primarily used for determining the classification of a dichotomous binary response variable. So we're trying to categorize a 0 or a 1. Okay. And they are incredibly sensitive to noise in the data. So a relatively small number of mislabeled examples can dramatically decrease the performance. And that's important, because if you want to utilize this incredibly potent technique, you have to understand the nuances of the data that you're working with. And in this case, if you have noisy data, you know, I would exercise caution in using a support vector machine. But if you have the very good data and you want powerful predictions, well, you've come to the right place. Support vector machines can be applied to complex data types beyond feature vectors, so graphs, sequences, relational data, by designing kernel functions for such a data. We'll get into the topic of kernel functions a, a little later. And support vector machine techniques have been extended to a number of tasks such as regression, principal component analysis, etc. So it is a very versatile tool. And Tuning support vector machines kind of remains a black art. Selecting a specific kernel and its parameters is usually done in a try and see manner. So think of the mad scientist who turns on this mysterious black box machine, and then you see him kind of turning knobs, trying to make sense of what's going on. He doesn't really understand what's happening underneath. That really is the art of working with support vector machines. I'm sure there are people out there who understand the nuances at a very deep level, but I think for general practitioners of data science, uh, the calibration of these models will remain a black art. Well, what are some of the support vector machine applications? There are numerous real-world applications of support vector machines. Handwritten character recognition. Image classification, such as facial recognition. Bioinformatics. Protein classifications, cancer classifications, text and hypertext categorization. Before we can really get into 
the nuances of support vacuum machine, we have to introduce a couple concepts. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to plot data along a two-dimensional feature space. And all the feature space is when we think of a graph, we think of you know an x, y coordinate system. Okay. Feature space is just another fancy term for saying that we're just going to plot an x, y coordinate, but it's not we're not going to call it x, y. And we plot our data along this feature space, and we're going to find a separation between the types of data. So it's a classification type exercise or clustering. If you saw the clustering tutorial previously, this would make a little more sense. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to split this space okay, with a line. And this line is a linear separator, and it's called a hyperplane. So the main question that I have, just by looking at this graph, if I make a line that split this plane, is, is this a good split between the classes? Well, one would look at it and say, yeah, I, it is a good split. I have all my red dots below the line, I have all my blue dots above the line, nothing is misspecified, so yes, it is a good split. Well, let's take that example a little further, and let's look at a couple uh, hyperplanes in this case. So we have our line, and we've decided that it creates a good split. So we're, we're in complete agreement there. Okay. So this one is a good split. But is this version better? So if I look at this one, I have a line. It's clearly splitting these two classes much like before. Uh, all the blue dots are on one side, all the red, reddish-orange dots are on the other side. It's separating them correctly, but is this line better than the hyperplane that, that we were looking at before? I don't know. How do we know? So taking that concept further, which one of these hyperplanes creates the op optimal separation? All of these ones are separating. But which one is better, and is there a way that we can determine which one of these hyperplanes is separating the, the data in a better fashion? And more importantly, how do you know? Well, to do this, we have to talk about the idea of a classification margin. Okay. And a classification margin can be thought of as the distance from our hyperplane to the various data points. And the example I like to think of, if you're familiar with uh, uh, American football, is imagine that this red line is the line of scrimmage. You've got players on both sides of the line. Okay, so you have your offensive line and your defensive line. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the distance of the linemen and defensive linemen from the line of scrimmage. Good. And the examples of data points that are closest to this hyperplane, in this case, are what's known as support vectors. Okay. And the margin P of the separator is the distance between the support vectors. Okay. And you have a support vector on both sides of the hyperplane. Okay. So you so that's, that's an important thing to notice when we're doing our classification. Well, a support vector machine relies on the principle that the optimal linear separator also maximizes the margin. And that's the key. We want to maximize the margin in this case. So the spread from our, uh, from our hyperplane or our imaginary line of scrimmage to the first data points that it sees or the support vectors. And that gap between them, we want to make as large as possible. And maximizing the margin is good according to intuition and PAC theory. And what this does is it applies that only support vectors matter. All other training examples are ignorable. So if I look at my entire group of dots that I have, only the ones that have the circle around the dots that are maximizing the margin are important to the training. All of the other data points are completely irrelevant, and essentially we can ignore them. 
And the most important training points are these support vectors, and they are what defines this hyperplane. Well, what if the training set is noisy? Imagine this scenario where I have one red dot that sits in the land of the blue, and then I have a blue dot that sits in the land of the red. Well, how do we address this in our, in our future space with a hyperplane? Well, one approach is that we can utilize a soft margin calculation. We'll talk about this in the upcoming slide. And another solution is using powerful kernels in the kernel trick. So let's talk about soft margin classification. Well, what if the training set is not linearly separable? So in my case, I, where I have my floating data points that exist on the wrong side of the line. So an offside penalty or an encroachment, <laughs> if you will. So I have slack variables that we can add that allow for misclassification of difficult or noisy examples, and they would result in a margin that's called soft. So we still calculate our soft, but then we introduce an error term, or a slack variable, if you will, um, that compensates for this. And overfitting can be controlled by a soft margin approach. So if we're building our models and we think overfitting is a problem, well, then let's utilize soft margin classification. Now let's jump into the topic of the kernel function. And the kernel function is, is a trickier idea to understand, but once, once you understand the basic mechanics of it, uh, you'll find that it's an incredibly powerful tool and allows for some really complex analysis. So rather than fitting nonlinear curves to the data, a support vector machine handles this by using the kernel function to map the data into a different space where the hyperplane can be used to do the separation. In this case, the hyperplane is a linear hyperplane. So if I'm looking at my data in this case, I see that it is surrounded by a hyperplane that follows a non-linear approach. I can't just take a, a simple linear cut to the data to get to it, but I have to do something else. And I don't want to use non-linear curves. I want to actually approach it from a completely different vantage point. And in this case, we're going to use the kernel function. Now, the, this method is prone to overfitting, and it really should be used sparingly. So let's imagine this example here. Okay, I'm looking at this example on the left-hand side of these two little jelly beans, and I'm looking at it head-on. I'm looking at it in a two-dimensional space. If I look at the split of the data points, or the, the shape of this hyperplane line, between the two, you can see it kind of bends and it snakes in between the two. Well, that's not a straight line, okay? That's a curved linear line, and it's a nonlinear line. The idea is that I employ the kernel function, and I can take these jelly beans, these masses of B1 and B2, and I can flip it onto a different dimension. And when I uh, transpose it into a different dimension of space, in a feature of space, I can now cut it with a straight linear line. So we can see that looking at the data head-on on the left-hand side, I can't apply this linear separator. It's a nonlinear curve. But then by using the, the kernel trick, in this case, or a kernel function, I can flip it and then put a line all the way through it. So let's talk a little bit more about this idea Data sets that are linearly separable with some noise work out great. So if I'm looking on a one-dimensional line, in this case, so I've got an x-axis going in a feature space moving in one direction. I have my data points that fit nicely on this line. I've created my hyperplane, which is a linear function that separates the support vectors. And I can see very clearly where the support vectors lie at both sides. Okay. And without any noise or misclassification, this approach works great in this one-dimensional space. But what am I going to do if the data set is just too hard? Imagine that I have this example where I have uh, data points to the left that are red. I have a 
chunk of him is sitting in the middle that are blue, and I have some red, reddish orange ones to the right. Well, to do the linear separation in this case, it's just, it's too difficult. We can't, in this dimensional, this one dimensional space, make it work. So to, to resolve this issue, is we map the data to a higher dimensional space. Now notice, when I add a second dimension in this case, okay, the data points now are kind of floating in the feature space. Now they still would line up to the line if I was to represent them in a one dimensional space. But now I'm actually able to make a cut of the data with a hyperplane that is linear. In this case, I see my support vectors. I can calculate the margin of the support vectors. But I'm able to represent the data in a higher dimensional space. So from one dimensions to two dimensions in order to create the, the linear classifier in the separator. Now this concept is, is really powerful and it can continue to be built off of. So an original feature space of a nonlinear the separable support vector machine can be mapped to some higher dimensional feature space where the training set is separable utilizing a kernel function. So now imagine that I'm taking a two-dimensional object in this case. So if I'm looking at my coordinate axis, I see that I, in order to capture all these points, I have to draw a two-dimensional line around them. All the blue points fall outside of it, and this doesn't quite work. Well, if I utilize the, the kernel function in this case, I can actually represent the data in a three-dimensional space. And now imagine this square that we're looking at is like a, a piece of paper or a piece of cardboard that we're going to just kind of lean up against a wall. And that leaning up against the wall creates the divide between these blue points that are kind of floating in three dimensions and then the reddish-orange points that sit below that uh, that membrane, if you will. So the idea is by taking data points in one dimension space and moving it up to a higher dimensional space, then we can create these linear uh, classifications and separators. Now that we've talked a little bit about feature spaces, I want to dive into the concept of uh, holographic projection. So fitting hyperplanes as separators, is, it's mathematically easy. We can draw from the kernel function to perform this, uh, this calculation. By replacing the raw input variables with a much larger set of features, we get a really nice property. A planar separator in the high dimensional space of feature vectors is a curved separator in the low dimensional space of the raw input variables. And what this is saying is that if I take my two-dimensional image and I project it up to three dimensions, I create my, uh, my straight line that I can cut through the data points. But then if I take this three-dimensional space and project it down to two dimensions, if I look at what that line would look like, in this case, it's actually going to look like a strange curved line. And now, what's amazing is that this image this particular line that we see here, it's a planar separator represented in 20-dimensional feature space projected back to the original two-dimensional space. So we've talked about going from you know, one dimensions to two dimensions, and then two dimensions to three dimensions. Well, we can go higher than that. We can go from three dimensions to four dimensions, four to five, and so on and so forth. There is no mathematical limit that we can go to. So in this case, here is data that is represented in a 20-dimensional feature space, and then I'm holographically projecting it back to a two-dimensional space. To me, this idea is just it's absolutely mind-blowing and it's amazing, but it, it can be done, and that's what the kernel trick does in a support vector machine. So the concept of a kernel mapping function is very powerful. It allows support vector machines to perform separations even with very complex boundaries, such as the one shown below. So we can have these incredible boundaries and data points spread all over the place. 
but through the mapping to higher dimensional space and then the holographic projection back to a two-dimensional space, we can create boundaries of incredible complexity. Let's now talk about the kernel trick. If we map the input vectors in a very high dimensional feature space, the task of finding the maximum margin separator becomes computationally intractable. The mathematics is all linear, which is good, but the vectors have a huge number of components. So taking the scalar product of two vectors is very expensive from a computational standpoint. So the higher up in dimensions that we go, the more difficult it becomes uh, to compute. The way to keep things tractable is through the use of the kernel trick. The kernel trick relies on Mercier's theorem, which is every semi-positive definite symmetric function is a kernel. For many mappings from a low dimensional space to a higher dimensional space, there is a simple operation on two vectors in the low dimensional space that can be used to compute the scalar product other two images in the higher dimensional space. And this is the kernel trick in and of itself. So we let the kernel do the work, doing the scale products in the obvious way. And this allows us to essentially cut some corners in the computational processes, which allow us to move throughout these higher dimensions with relative ease from a computing standpoint. Well, what the kernel trick achieves is that all of the computations that we need to do to find the maximum margin separator can be expressed in terms of scalar products between pairs of data points in this higher dimensional feature space. These scalar products are the only part of the computation that depends on the dimensionality of the higher dimensional space. So if we had a fast way to do the scalar products, we would not have to pay a price for solving the learning problem in the higher dimensional space. The kernel trick is just a magic way of doing scalar products a whole lot faster than is usually possible. It relies on choosing a way of mapping to the higher dimensional feature space that allows fast scalar products. So that is what the kernel trick ultimately achieves. Now let's talk about some commonly used kernels. There may be an infinite number of kernels which one can employ. Here are some of the more common kernels. We have a polynomial, we have Gaussian radial functions, neural networks. And for the neural network kernel, there's one hidden unit per support vector. So the process of fitting the maximum margin hyperplane decides how many hidden units to use. Also, it may actually violate our Mercier's condition in this case. But the kernels can take a variety of shapes and forms. And this just shows you that uh, the complexity can get to very high in terms of what kernel functions we're using. Now let's talk about the classification rule. The final classification rule is eloquently simple. We have our set of support vectors. And all the cleverness goes into selecting the support vectors that maximize the margin and computing the weight to use on each support vector. We also need to choose a good kernel function, and we may need to choose a lambda for dealing with non-separable cases. Support vector machines, they work very well in practice. The user must choose the kernel function and its parameters, but the rest is automatic. The test performance is very good. They can be expensive in time and space for really large data sets. The computation of the maximum margin hyperplane depends on the square of the number of training cases. And we need to store all the support vectors. Support vector machines are very good if you have no idea about what the structure to impose on the task. And the kernel trick can be used to do principal component analysis in a much higher dimensional space, thus giving a nonlinear version of principal component analysis in the original space. And that's essentially what the kernel trick is doing. It's performing perform, um, PCA, principal component analysis, but in higher dimensional spaces. So support vector machines 
incredibly powerful tool. Now let's spend a little time and we'll use a support vector machine in the diagnosis and detection of breast cancer. The data set that we're going to use contains information related to females with tumors of different characteristics and whether or not the tumor was benign or malignant. This data set contains 700 individuals of which 458 were benign and 241 were malignant. So we have a good spread of different cases that had cancer and those that did not. Our goal is to devise a support vector machine to classify a case based upon tumor characteristics as being benign or malignant. Before we begin building our support vector machine, let's first understand a little bit about the data by looking at the data set. Now, of course, if we were doing this in practice, we would conduct a full EDA, as we have discussed in the previous lectures. But for now, I just want to just get a sense of what we're looking at. So on the left-hand side, we have our sample code. And this is just individuals, okay, where they're just given a patient ID number, and each line represents a person. We have certain measurements uh, that are performed about the tumor that was extracted. Okay. Some of these are the clump thickness, the uniformity of the cell size, uniformity of cell shape, marginal adhesion, single uh, epithelial cell size, barrier nuclei, bland chromomatin, normal nuclear mitosis, and uh, finally the class. And the class is really what we're interested in. We're interested in um, zero represents a benign, and one represents a malignant tumor. And what's interesting are these values all take a range from 1 to 10. So when we're looking at the cell, a biologist or somebody goes in and they have a very strict set of criterion that says, okay, for cells of certain you know, thickness, okay, I have to rate it from a 1 to a 10 in this case. But this is what our data set looks like. These are all the measurements, and at the end, we know from our examples whether or not somebody has cancer or they don't. Now we'll go about building our support vector machine. First, we, let's run a tuning function to identify the best parameters to use for a support vector machine model. So when we actually employ this algorithm, we first run this tuning function. And what the process does is it runs a 10-fold cross-validation methodology and it identifies a couple parameters. In this case, it identifies a gamma and a cost parameter. And after the tuning procedure, the output says, use a gamma of 0 0.01 and also use a cost function of 1. In the R language, we're going to use the E1071. And this is our support vector machine uh, algorithm. And this approach uses a linear kernel as a standard algorithm. So after I've run my tuning function, as you can see in the code below, I've actually specified my gamma of 0 0.01 and my cost of 1 in this case. Well, we created a random test sample of the data set, and we included only the measurement variables. This data wasn't involved in the initial training of the support vector machine, but we'll use it to test and validate the results from passing the data through the support vector machine. So now I'm taking just a chunk of data with all these various measurements. I don't know what the result um, variable is in this case, the response variable. I feed it through our support vector machine. And at the end, for each sample, I have the known class and the predicted class. Now, if we wanted to get into all of the performance metrics, you know, the ROC, classification accuracy, we can get into that. But I just wanted to show that for this particular data set, the support of the vector machine in terms of pure predictive accuracy uh, is correct 97.1% of the time. So based off of these various points of data that were measured and collected,
that we can predict with 97% accuracy whether or not someone has breast cancer. To me, it is absolutely amazing that we can do this. And a support vector machine is one of the most powerful predicted algorithms in our tool belt. Uh, it has its own nuances and subtleties, but if we want high level of predictive performance, this is the algorithm to use. Now, it's going to be very difficult to explain it to people who don't understand what a support vector machine is, uh, how it's functioning, but just understand that uh, that's the trade-off with certain algorithms, and a support vector machine certainly is one of them. Thank you for spending the time with me today to talk about support vector machines. I enjoy this topic very much. To me, it's absolutely fascinating that we can create algorithms that operate in higher dimensional spaces than the three uh, physical dimensions that we're used to. So with that said, uh, thanks again for joining in, and I look forward to, to going through other topics with you.